and get started. Um, my name is Rebecca McNulty. I'll be facilitating this afternoon. I'm really excited to present Anne Prucha and Casey Tart, who will be giving our presentation entitled Our Story in the Interests of All, where they'll be sharing about their use of open educational resources in personalized adaptive learning. Okay. We are so happy to have the opportunity to speak to all of you this afternoon. I'll turn it over to Anne. She's going to get started, and we uh, are going to going to talk to you guys about OER and and how we got started, and how we're still going, and how we're going to keep going. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Anne Pruka, and I am a, an instructor in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at UCF. I teach I teach Spanish, and I also teach TESOL. And um, we did have a question about our title. How do you pronounce it? So we would say our, our story. This is kind of to let you know what our journey and has been when it comes to OER. And in the interest of all, um, we'll talk a little bit about this, but really this relates uh, in many ways to accessibility. So thank you for having us. Yeah, and so I'm Casey Tart. I also am a senior instructor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages here at UCF. Um, and I teach Latin American studies as well. So a little bit about OER. So that's why we're here. We're talking about OER. That's what this whole event is about. So just, um, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about it, but just to give a little background, um, they're educational materials, freely accessible, openly licensed. Um, the five R's of OER, retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And there are no legal restrictions to that. So if you find something that is classified OER, you can use it. You can change it to suit your needs. Um, faculty find, adapt, and create. And that's exactly what we did and what we're going to talk to you about today. One of the most important things about OER to us was that they were free. They were free to us, but more importantly, they were free to our students. Um, and just a little definition here, OER are learning, teaching, and research materials in any format and medium that reside in the public domain or are under copyright that have been released under an open license, okay? So that's, again, no cost access, and you can reuse them, repurpose them, adapt them, redistribute them however you please once, you know, they're out there and, and released. So Casey mentioned the five R's of using OER, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, and retain. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of a, to use Amanda's word, zippy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this just gives you a sense of all the different things that you can do um, with OER content. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about this um, when we discuss the details of what we did. Yeah, and just a little bit more about this. We get questions a lot of times like, how do you know if it's good content? How do you know if it's content that you want to use? But you have to take a look at it, right? And if right. it's not up to your standard or exactly what you want, you can always revise it, right? So right. Um, that's you could use you could use part of it and revise it or use part of something that you find that is OER um, and then add to it. Right. And something that you you find that things that work now might not work later. It might not work the same with another class or another group of students. So that's another thing that that we really like about this type of content. So for those of you that are here and you can let us know in the chat, kind of what does OER mean to you? Just so that we can get an idea. What does it mean to you, to our students, to our institutions? So we're curious about, you know, what you what you all think. Or what comes to mind when you think about OER. OER. If you could share in the chat. Okay. Free and flexible access. Mm -hmm. Counter the downturn in student enrollment. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Great for mm -hmm. students. Oh, multilingual. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Student success. Yeah, I really like that going along with affordability, accessibility, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Well, it looks like the chat is slowing down, so we're going to continue. Another one is free, oh. no cost, textbooks open. Mm -hmm. Great. What else? Free and flexible, yes. Great for students. It's also great for faculty, which we'll talk about a little bit 
uh, later on. Okay. Um, so why did we choose OER? Uh, well, many of you mentioned free cost in the chat, um, and that's definitely a factor. Um, one of the reasons that we chose OER, oops, I think we went ahead. Can you go back, Casey, to slide oh. five? Okay, so one of the reasons Aaron, that we like, chose sorry. OER was because of the cost of what our students were required to purchase for the courses that we redesigned, which were an elementary Spanish language course sequence. It's a gen ed course. It's um, Spanish one and Spanish two. And um, these courses enroll over 3000 students a year. So um, cost is a big factor because they were having to spend a lot of money on a uh, virtual textbook, uh, the publisher learning management system that went along with it to do homework and other things. Um, but even if a student took only the second half of the course because they didn't need the first half based on their experience in high school or other experience, they still had to spend a lot of money. Um, another thing is accessibility, but that goes hand in hand with costs because you know, a lot of students didn't have the funds to purchase it or they didn't have the funds when class started. And so they would tell us things like, I can't buy the book yet or I can't buy access yet because I don't have my financial aid. And so by the time they got it, they were already behind because even though it's an elementary level course, it's fast paced and it's four credits and there's a lot of material to cover. So if you don't get access to your course materials until the second or third week of class, it can really, you know, hamper your progress and your success in the course. But also another thing we learned, you know, students weren't really purchasing the textbook in, in many, in a lot of things. We don't have any, this is more um, anecdotal uh, information, but it became very clear to us that a lot of students were not purchasing the required materials, you know, virtual textbook or hard copy if they preferred, but they all needed to have an access code to the publisher learning management system. So a lot of them weren't doing that. Um, and instead they were going out on the internet to look things up. Um, so another thing, another reason we cho chose OER, which we'll talk about later on, but at the beginning of this whole thing, Casey was the one who kind of spearheaded it and she decided to try personalized adaptive learning using the platform Realize It um, and ingesting publisher content into the personalized adaptive learning platform. Um, and so she wanted to use Realize It, the PAL platform to try it out. Um, but because we weren't getting a good response from the publisher on ingesting their content, um, we thought, well, let's just use open education resources instead for the course content, i.e. textbook in lieu of a textbook and practice and homework activities. And so this originally was not our idea, to be honest. Our idea was to take the publisher content and have it ingested into the adaptive learning platform that we were using. So in, you know, it, it actually was a good thing that the publisher did not really, um, wasn't really responsive to us uh, in a timely manner. We just had to move ahead. So we said, you know what, we'll do our own thing and we'll go OER. Yeah, and so this was five years ago and we'll talk a little bit about our timeline. Well, I didn't even know what OER was, but then mm -hmm. as we started to learn more about it, we kind of had this, you know, aha moment, for lack of a better term, we were realized that we already created our own content because we talk about, you know, textbooks, especially our language textbooks. They can sometimes be really static and kind of two dimensional in the sense that, you know, culture is not really presented in a dynamic way. Um, you know, now at UCF, we're a Hispanic serving institution. So we were getting heritage speakers of Spanish in our class, especially that were kind of like, maybe they weren't as great at the language, but of course they're going to be very familiar with their culture. And they would say things like, we don't do that. We're not like that, you know? And so by using OER, we were able to create content and have student input, you know, that, that was more reflective of their backgrounds and culture. Additionally, students, when we would kind of survey them um, formally or informally, they would say things like, this isn't what I need. This isn't the Spanish that I need. I work at, you know, in the tourism industry. I work in the hospitality industry. I work in retail and I'm, you know, needing to speak to people and I'm, you know, learning vocabulary that 
I don't have. So we yeah, were all even, even in the medical industry, you know, exactly. studying to become nurses, doctors, medical technicians. Mm -hmm. So we were already creating content to suit our students' needs and to make it more robust in our face-to-face -face classrooms, in our online classrooms. And so as we were going through this, we used materials that we had already created and used before we even knew what it was. Um, we created new content to go into the PAL, into the Realize It system of the adaptive learning. And then we incorporated four of the, four of the five R's of OER, reused, we reused, we revised, we remixed, and we redistributed this. Um, all with the help of our amazing instructional designer, Jessica Toho Rabel. Um, Ann and I worked very closely uh, over a semester for hours to compile all of this information. And we had a system in Google Drive with Jessica, you know, with colors and numbers and code words so that, you know, as we were finishing things, different concepts within the scope and sequence that again, Ann and I created for our courses, she was able to input um, all of this information. So to talk a little bit about our approach and our process, what we did when we decided we were not gonna use the publisher materials, we did, did some searching, did some research, we looked for OER content for elementary college level Spanish courses, uh, you know, the first year sequence. Um, but at that time, there really, there was nothing out there ex that we found except for a information from the University of Texas at Austin. And they had an OER offering for first year Spanish. Um, and it was filled with grammar explanations, um, vocabulary, uh, videos of uh, Spanish speakers speaking and incorporating the grammar vocabulary for each topic. It wasn't even actually an online textbook. It was different links that you could click on and it would take you to the content based on different topics, you know, grammar topics, for example. Um, but it's interesting because today when we do sort of an informal search, uh, along the line, well, actually along the lines of what we did, you know, back when we started, there are numerous resources, textbooks, websites, universities who have offerings, um, have universities who are offering online textbooks in Spanish that are all OER, websites that are OER, um, Jessica Toho Rabel, John Benachek and Lily Duback have all shared with us things that have come across their desk um, that we have been able to refer to or use if we need to. But the point of this being that at the time we started this, there was virtually nothing out there. And now there, there's quite a bit. And so the other day when we were preparing for this, I just did sort of an informal search um, and I found like 10 different websites and or uh, OER textbooks for span for college level Spanish. Um, so um, let me let's go to the next slide though, so we can continue to talk about our approach and process. Casey. Yes. So this is kind of how we incorporated the materials into our courses, both the OER and our own materials that were also OER, as we've talked about. Um, within the Realize It platform, which is a personalized ad adaptive learning platform, we had many activities that were grammar, vocabulary, cultural content. Um, instead of having a textbook, all of our learning content was loaded um, into that system. We had videos that we put in for the students to watch that were geared toward the grammar point, geared toward the vocabulary, um, with call outs in yellow underneath kind of what they should be listening for, you know, because it was obviously they're not going to understand everything in the video, but if they have that call out, then they can focus in, start to hone their ear to hear spoken Spanish. We had practice activities with determined knowledge questions, if you're familiar with Realize It, um, where students, if they, you know, scored a certain level, they could move on to the next concept, which again, addressed issues that we had in our in our courses before we incorporated images, infographics, things that were more up to date because again, in the normal textbook, the, those were always things that students were, you know, they would laugh at the pictures or they would laugh at the, you know, and say, what, you know, what is this? Or it's weird, or we can't relate to it. Um, we used the 
um, Materia platform that we have at UCF to incorporate games so that students could practice directly into the system. And then within Canvas, we had writing assignments, we had discussions, we had conversation assignments where they would um, meet up with their classmates. More video, we used um, the Lightboard to create grammar videos. Our students still talk about those. I mean, every Every time we get our SPOIs, I know I speak for Anne and myself, one of the things that they say that they like the most are the videos in our course. When they say what they like the least or what their suggestion is, the more positive word, the suggestion for the course, they say more videos. So that was, you know, something that we paid attention to um, and are continuing to, to create videos. Culture, and they wanted more of that as well. Um, and then our assessments were also in Canvas and all, you know, OER created by us um, and, and housed in these two separate platforms. And within Canvas, students had a direct connect to realize it. Within our module and one of their assignments, they clicked you know, their bar button and they, it took them to their learning content and their practice within the um, adaptive learning system. Yeah, and I think just, just to emphasize, you know, this this is about OER, this conference and this presentation is most about OER, but we are mentioning Realize It in Canvas because that is where we are housing and delivering the OER content that we have used, reused, remixed, adapted, and created. So um, that that's just to be clear on why we're talking about Realize It in Canvas, okay? Mm -hmm. And again, something that our students are going to have access to anyway. So, you know, right. using what we have in order to, to disseminate all of the information for them. So the numbers, um, since we started using OER content in this course sequence, which is uh, Spanish one and Spanish two, um, it, well, it's been 18 semesters, uh, including summer semesters, okay? Uh, and that represents 167 class sections. And since we have up to, well, usually 35 students in each class, that is the class cap. Occasionally, you know, a student will drop here or there. That's uh, over 5,500 students that have been served um, by taking these OER classes, uh, Spanish classes. And that's over half a million dollars in savings. So not too shabby. We're really excited about that. We're proud about it. And um, we probably should have shared some of this in our presentation, but we can guarantee you that we do get a lot of comments from students um, during and at the end of the semester, or even at the beginning saying that they're really excited that they don't have to spend money. We always send out a couple of weeks before the semester starts. And then one week before the semester starts, we send a welcome message and we tell them that they do not have to buy a textbook or anything for the course, that everything, all the materials they need are free. Um, and we want them to know that ahead of time so that they don't go to the bookstore and get confused. Um, so we even got a lot of really great responses that are very positive at the beginning or even before the course has started, you know, thanking us and saying that that has made their day. It's made a big difference because now they can spend the money on food or, you know, any anything else that they need to spend their money on. Um, so, you know, for us, the cost is zero. The cost to students who take these courses fully online is zero. Um, but the value is really priceless. Um, so I do. I did notice. I know. I know. Rebecca's going to talk about the questions in the chat afterward, or we, we'll we'll talk answer your questions. But I did notice that someone asked about the cost uh, for fully online students. The cost is free because it's part of their tech fee. Um, I but there is a there is a cost if you're not fully online. Although it is still less than twenty dollars per credit hour, um, which meets the threshold for affordability initiatives, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but at, so so we use this OER version of these courses actually in all modalities. Mm -hmm. And I believe moving forward, starting in summer of 2024, even online students will have to pay a nominal fee. But again, as Anne said, it's going to be under $20 a credit hour. I think the total cost to students will be will be $40, which is a drastic difference from um, depending on if they bought the access code, the book or the access code and the book, you know, um, close to $300 for the textbook that we were using over two semesters. So it's still a drastic savings for our students. So some of our uh, happy discoveries along the way um, were just learning about 
OER at UCF and elsewhere and how people were using it and how it could apply to us and some of the best practices going in since at first we didn't we didn't know that much about it. Um, affordability, affordability and access. Anne and I were more focused on maybe some of the challenges that we perceived in the classroom. But once we started doing this, we realized and kind of saw a bigger picture, you know, and fitting into the UCF Affordable Instructional Materials Initiative using OER um, and, you know, low cost to students, the state university system affordability counts. We have those badges on our courses as well. And kind of going back to the last slide, you know, that is visible to students when they go to register for our particular sections now. And I will tell you uh, the differences on our wait list compared with our colleagues who use the traditional textbook <laughs> are great. A um, lot more people, you know, trying to get into our courses and you know, this is is part of the reason why I believe um, advantages and benefits for students and faculty alike, the freedom, the flexibility and the ability to change it, to make it better, to make it better fit a group of students. Like I said earlier, um, I'm sure you've all had the experience in your classroom where maybe one group really understood this concept and was great at this, but another group struggled more with that one. And then concepts that students just kind of broadly struggle with you know you're able to kind of in a in a way that's more live and instant make changes that are going to help them and that are going to facilitate their learning um, and then again the fatigue the static content a lot of fatigue not only for the students but for us as well with the traditional textbook and kind of that canned spanish experience um, that, you know, none of us really enjoyed. That's part of the reason that we were creating so many things above and beyond what was presented in the textbook. Um, and then student content interaction, just the way the students themselves are interacting with the content, the way they're going back into the system, they're working more, they're working longer, they're practicing more, they're practicing longer. You know, that for us, because I mean, as if you're learning a language, what do you need to do if you're learning anything? You know, it's that repetition and and practice that's really going to get you, you know, where you need to be. So just just to share some uh, advice, if you will, um, we do get the question a lot. You know, how long did it take you? What would you recommend? What do you suggest? Do you have any advice, you know, for people who are about to you know, embark on a course redesign um, using OER, definitely take your time. I mean, we'll show you a timeline at the end of this. Um, we started, this whole thing started in 2017 with Casey kind of looking into it and, and, and giving personalized adaptive learning a try, which I know we're not talking about that. We're talking about OER, but that was the thing that got us to OER. So this process really has been over many years. Um, we worked together and then we also invited colleagues to join us um, in incorporating OER into other courses. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but definitely don't work alone. Casey and I worked together the first couple of years, the first few semesters. Um, we actually had a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of work. It's not something that can be done overnight. Um, so we recommend that you work with someone or, or in a group of people that you get along with and that you with whom you share the same ideas and values um, when it comes to the course redesign. Um, you can make it fun. Um, you can divide up the work. That's the other thing, divide and conquer. Um, and just that way, you know that you're not alone because, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's quite a bit of work, but, but uh, you know, it's, be it's better to share it if you can. Um, take advantage of your resources, whatever resources you have out there, depending on where you teach, you know, your librarians, uh, we have a textbook affordability librarian, uh, that's Lily, John Benichek is uh, one of our librarians who, who, who helps us with our particular subject being Spanish, Jessica Toho Rabel is an instructional designer that we've worked with, we've collaborated with folks at the Center for for distributed learning, we've relied on them. They're always there for us when we have questions or maybe we need guidance. Um, do you have any ideas? So we're really grateful to them. Uh, also our chair, our chair has been very supportive. 
Um, we presented this to her and said, this is what we'd like to do. And when you have a program with multiple sections that serves over 3000 students a year, it's a pretty big deal for her to let us, you know, try something like this and then establish it um, because it is making an impact on a big, important program that serves many, many students. So she's been really supportive um, and she's been a great resource for us too. Um, funding is great if you can look for funding. We've had the benefit of, of getting some grant money um, to work on this and also to have time and space to make plans and to make changes and revisions because we've done multiple revisions. We keep on improving, adding. So it's a process. It's not like we did it and then we were done. We're never done. Although that I think is something that I think is true of a lot of us as educators. You know, every semester we like to change things up. We like to think about what went right, what went wrong, how could we do it better? What is the latest and greatest? What are the new best practices? If you're teaching online, face-to-face, -face, uh, what's going on in the world that you want to incorporate you know, into your classes? What's going on with your students um, and their interests and their backgrounds? Um, so if you can find funding to give you time and space um, and resources to get this done, it's, it's a great, great thing to have. Um, and then talk it up, you know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your chair, talk to colleagues that are in and out of your department, talk to the people at your faculty center, uh, see if they can help you or whatever uh, office it is at your institution that supports faculty um, in their teaching. So these are just some pieces of advice that we would would give. And um, a lot of times people ask us that. And, and one of the number one questions is, how long did this take you? Well, that's really hard to answer because we're still doing it. Yeah. So um, it, it's an ongoing process. And something that I'll just say too, is you don't have to jump into the deep end of the pool mm -hmm. head first. Sure. Like I generally do and drag in into the water with me. You can use OER in simple ways that are going to alleviate costs to your students. It doesn't have to be for your entire right. course. And so just so that you all have kind of, again, an idea, we've talked about our timeline, we've mentioned years here and there, this is more of a of sort of a clear picture of how we started fall of 2017. I went to, well, summer of 2017, I went to a faculty center for teaching and learning conference presentation. Um, why was I there? Because it was geared toward folks in STEM fields, but I was intrigued by the description and I went and I thought, you know what, this could work for modern languages as well. I mean, when you're speaking a language, in a sense, there are equations and things that you plug different expressions into and there is a word order and, you know, maybe this could could also work for us and work for our students. And so I approached Jessica Toho Rabel after the um, the presentation and I said, would you like to work with me? I would love to try to create some review for my students in my lower level Spanish courses. And she said, well, you know, yeah, let's Let's try, let's do it. So I used it in fall of 2017. Well, moving into spring of 2018, we were going to experience a textbook change at the elementary level. And I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna have my instructional designers do all this work for just one semester. We're changing books. You know, this is, it's that's not really fair to them. And students that I had in that second, you know, course of the elementary sequence, they were writing and asking, where is my realize it? Where is my content? Where is my, you know? So I thought, okay, well, if the students are asking for more, maybe this is something that we need to keep talking about. Um, and so in spring of 2018, we were approached by uh, Dr. Wendy Howard. She knew that I was doing some work um, with adaptive learning. And she said, maybe you should submit a proposal to the course redesign initiative. So that's when, you know, I, <laughs> with my harebrained scheme said, Anne, let's do this. And she agreed, thankfully. And so we spent, you know, that time and summer of 18 for, um, working on our proposal, getting everything in. We were accepted in fall of 2018 and talked a little bit about us trying to work with a publisher. They were dragging their feet by October. I said, look, we have to get this done. We're supposed to be teaching both of these courses in the spring. So over fall of 2018, in just a few months, we completely redesigned our courses. We found our OER content. We got to work with Jessica, like we mentioned earlier, 
And in spring of 2019, we piloted these first courses. I was teaching 1120 and was teaching 1121. We got great responses from the students. We got a lot of suggestions for how to make it better. We realized ourselves where things were kind of going really well and not so much. Um, and so then fall of 2019, we continued. Well, up pops another opportunity for a course redesign initiative extension round two. I said, let's apply. Ann and I applied. We were able to have a course assistant that we hired, um, kind of a content subject matter expert. She spent the summer um, going over, well, after round two, she spent the summer of 2020 going through the entire system, all of our OER, adding more, um, especially where videos and images were concerned to try to make it a little more um, aesthetically appealing to the students and just give little kind of chunks of examples of how different things were used within their content. Um, and so in fall of 2020, we started to teach the courses now with this new and revised material spring of 2021, another proposal um, was submitted now with two other faculty members, and we included the two intermediate courses, um, continued to work on an upper level advanced grammar course that another colleague had started on her own in Spanish and added um, a Spanish literature course at the 3000 level. Um, and so from there, um, starting in the spring, I believe, of 22, we were now teaching all of the redesigned courses between the, the four of us and continue to do so. And so, you know, from fall of 22 until now, we're adding more, we're doing more, um, looking for opportunities. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so this started with two elementary Spanish courses and went on to incorporate two intermediate Spanish courses and then incorporating OER as well into three uh, advanced level courses that are taken by Spanish majors and minors. And in at least one of those courses, some of the course content is OER, some of it is not. So back to Casey's um, comment uh, a few minutes ago, when you decide to do something like this, you don't have to redesign your entire course with OER. It can be a component of your course that could help perhaps reduce costs or make it easier on you to incorporate the materials that you want um, without having to spend money or get permissions or things like that. So just to make it clear that some of the courses are 100% OER, but some of them are not. Um, but uh, it's exciting for us that this started at the elementary level and now is has incorporated intermediate and then three advanced level courses that are taken by all our majors and minors. Yes, five of the six redesigned courses are 100% OER. Right. Only one of them uses some ingested uh, material from, from the publisher. And then just something else that I'll mention, I'm using OER in ways now that I didn't even think about. I mean, we're talking about course content and what we're presenting and teaching, but I'm sure no matter what your discipline is that you always have students approach you and say, how can I practice more? What else can mm -hmm. I do? I'm really having trouble with this. I don't understand this. Is another way you can explain it to me. Um, and so I started several semesters ago going a little bit overboard and I send an announcement to my students in Canvas every single day. And I thought I started in the summer because I thought, OK, I need my little pilot group and this is either going to go really, really well or it's going to go really, really terribly. And they're going to say, why are you sending a message? Why are you sending an announcement every single day? Well, what I found was that they really liked my announcements. And they looked forward to them and they were again making comments. She reaches out. I've never felt more connected in an online class. And so I'm like, okay, this is this is a good thing. Well, guess what I'm doing now when I get an email like that? Maybe I get one, maybe I get two. Sometimes I get three about a certain topic or I see how they're performing on assessments. I've started incorporating OER and more resources into those daily announcements Monday through Friday cut to, you know, maybe three semesters now that I've been doing this when I got my last set of SPOIs, I had students saying, I love my announcements where I have more practice and it's completely optional, but it's a way for me to say, you know, try this or work on this, or this is what we're having trouble with. And again, it's all OER sourced content, even in my announcements. Okay, so um, we just um, added this list of resources that are actually taken from the OER guides at UCF. 
Um, there's so many other resources out there, but this just gives you a short list to start with. Um, so if you go to, you know, if you go to the ucf.edu website and if you put OER in the search box, you know, you can come to this page. Um, and there's a lot of information there that's really, really helpful. Um, so we just wanted to share this little, this list with you. So you might want to take a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to share this um, yes. PowerPoint presentation. And also, I apologize on the timeline on the previous slide. I realized that some of the text is hard to read. Um, that's a timeline infographic that I used uh, on the website Canva. Um, but I realized now in the PowerPoint presentation, it's a little hard to read. So I apologize for that. But we're happy to send out the PowerPoint or, or make sure that it gets sent to you. Yes. And so with that, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Anime for, you know, your attendance and for your attention. Um, we're always happy to talk about this. We're happy to answer any questions that you all have now. I know that we have um, some time. We tried to be really cognizant of, of um, how long we spoke so that we would be able to, to hear from all of you. So with that, thank you. And any questions or comments, we're happy, happy to hear them and happy to answer. Thank you. We can start with some of the questions from the chat. Um, Amy Darty asks, in terms of pre-post use of OER, was there an improvement for persistence learning and or a change in your DFW rates? Yes, we saw a change immediately. We started in spring 2019. Like I said, they compared it to the last time each of us had taught those courses, which for both of us was probably um, fall of 18, because a lot of time, you know, we, um, as instructors, we have a 4-4, teaching load a majority of the time. Um, and so we had recently taught lower level Spanish courses. So what we saw was an increase in student success, those grades of A, B, and C. We saw a decrease in our drop fail withdrawal rates, and we saw an increase in student satisfaction where the SPOIs were concerned. And that has continued. So still yeah, trying. Just to, just to clarify SPOIs, I'm not sure. Um, oh, if everybody knows. That, that's the evaluations that students complete to evaluate our teaching and the course. And, and I actually, I, the first semester after we started doing this, when we got my, my evaluations were the highest they had ever been. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And then another question from the chat. Um, when you get grants, what have been the best ways to spend that money in your experience? I, oh, <laughs> well, I was going to say that one of the best ways to spend the money was on um, getting a course assistant who is a subject matter expert. Also, well, our first course assistant was a graduate student um, of Spanish, and she had taught these courses as a graduate teaching assistant. Um, so she really was an expert on this as well. Um, and just being able to collaborate with her on making changes, making revisions, making additions, uh, correcting errors that we found um, in the OER content that we had created, remixed, reused, adapted, et cetera, revised. Um, so I think that was one of the absolute best ways to use grant funding. Yes. Casey, do you want to add to that? Yeah, and that, so that was exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. And I will say as well that that former grad student that helped us um, left UCF, taught in the K-12 system. Uh, we recently had um, a hiring for an, a full-time Spanish instructor. She applied for the job. She got the job. And one of the caveats of her saying that she, you know, was going to come back and teach Spanish was that she would only teach sections that were you know, using OER and continue uh, working with us. So that, again, was kind of like another thing, you know, that made us made us feel good about, you know, the direction that that we're moving in. Yeah, because and it's not, you know, most of what we do is for students, but yeah. obviously it's making a difference for us and our colleagues as well. And people yeah. are recognizing that. Yeah, and, and we also had a couple of course assistants that we used our funding for who were undergraduate students of Spanish. Um, and so we were able to collaborate with them in which they supported us in doing research and you know gathering assets and things like that. 
Um, but they were able to share with us the undergraduate student perspective on content, right? Which is part of the reason we've gone to OER was because we want content that resonates more, resonates better with our students as opposed to the static uh, traditional textbook content. Um, but it also gave them a great opportunity to work in this capacity and learn about what we do and they even told us that. And, you know, in the long run, it looked great on their resume, but it gave them a lot of really great experience um, in pedagogical practices and organization and research. And so that was really gratifying to us to work with them. Yeah. Oh, um, one more thing. Um, another another good use of our grant money was we were we were given the opportunity to have a course release. So instead of teaching three four courses, which we have to do per semester, we taught three. So that did give us some time. That only happened once, but we definitely took advantage of it. So if your institution yes. allows that, if that's something you can request, mm -hmm. um, I, I recommend it. Yeah. Another question from the chat. Kevin also suggested tools to get grant funds. Any examples of helpful tools to share besides the ones mentioned here? I can't think of any in particular, especially as far as, you know, because we were kind of internally funded for this through the UCF Board of Trustees, the Pegasus Innovation Lab. Um, but I have <laughs> applied for a couple of external grants, not directly related to this, more along the lines of what I'm doing in Latin American studies. And so I think it's just a question of getting out there and exploring and reading and clicking and opening emails, you know, that that come your way, because there is so much out there um, and available. And I do think that because this is something that, you know, has been on on our radar for a while, but is becoming, you know, more and more kind of out there and you know people more people are hearing about it i tend to think that there are going to be more opportunities but specifically i can't think of anything right now i don't know about ian no i can't think of anything right now i mean casey you know we we were funded more internally although we both have applied for external grants for other projects however i do think that some of that external grant funding that at least I've received, you know, those, the types of grants I've applied for could have been used for an OER type thing. Um, but this is a little bit different than, um, than grants, but there are organizations out there that support faculty who are exploring OER and in, trying to incorporate OER. Um, you know, for example, the Florida Virtual Campus, um, if you are in Florida, um, I've been working with them. They are actually creating a free uh, online course, sort of a to-do type thing or a how-to uh, that'll be delivered in Canvas, uh, how to start off with OER, how to incorporate, incorporate OER, what OER is. So there are organizations out there that are very supportive um, of faculty who want to embark on this. Are there other questions? Well, it doesn't seem like it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Anne, Thank for you sharing your well. story. And yeah, this was fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for being here.